I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people with faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like you know grassroots neighborhood organizations a lot of these were sponsored by the church what does it mean to say that the christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there um, you're always uh being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects welcome to the magnificast the podcast about christianity and leftist politics i'm dean detloff i'm a phd student at the institute for christian studies in toronto and I'm Matt Bernico. I teach media studies at Greenville University in Greenville, Illinois. Dean, th- this week I saw uh, I saw Endgame. I saw that new Game of Thrones, and I saw Big Brother. Uh, and I want to give one big spoiler to everybody. Please, you ready for it? I'm ready. I can't wait. Uh, Jesus Christ is still the King of Kings. <laughs> uh, you've heard about the Infinity Gauntlet, but have you heard about Eternal Life? You've heard about the Iron Throne, but you've ever heard about heaven? <laughs> uh, you've heard of, you've heard about the head of household, but do you know the real eviction is uh, eternal damnation? <laughs> wow, pretty good, pretty good so, content right there off the bat. Yeah, the, you can put that in your uh, put that in your notes for the Magnificast Youth Ministry uh, section of the class, and uh, to, that will be on the test for sure. Okay, but for real though, this week we're going to talk about something that's way not – that's different. Uh, this week we're going to talk about Roland Bohr's new book, Red Theology on the Christian Communist Tradition. Um, we're going to take a look at a section um, that is, I think, a little bit weird actually, but pretty fun, just the same. Um, we're going to look at a section that he wrote about Christian communism and the Bolsheviks. So uh, you've heard that tired old historical narrative about how uh, the communists always just persecute Christians. Well, this week you're going to get a little bit of a different taste of that, um, where the communists pay some attention to the Christians and it's not so bad. So that's different. <laughs> but before uh, we do any of that, I have to give Dean um, his weekly Reddit Reddit gift of, <laughs> of uh, weird ass uh, post from our Christianity. You're really down in the mines every week, uh, just hacking away, uh, yeah. pros- prospecting for these gems. That's right. I I got my I'm I got my sluicing bucket, and I'm just <laughs> getting these gems cleaned off. Um, all right, so here's the first one for uh, for you, Dean, and I need a good solid answer from you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is posted three months ago. Okay. Um, Shelf life still good, I think. Yeah, it's still it's still fresh enough, I would say. Um, <clears throat> how would I find out if I'm cursed? So, I consider myself a Christian, believe in God, Jesus, etc. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all, all, all the all the things. <laughs> you know, the, the Iron Throne, etc. <laughs> uh, but based on the events in my life, I'm starting to wonder if it's possible that I've been cursed. Hmm. Mm -hmm. disproportionately i've had bad luck many failures and been taken advantage of due to my inability to stand up for myself i tried (laughs) but never taken seriously (laughs) that's right uh at first i thought it was karma parentheses i know not a christian term (laughs) but is it possible it's a spiritual matter is there a way to discern why this is happening to me so frequently also it might sound silly but this is a genuine question Oh, so boy. Dean, what do you think? How do you know if you're cursed? If you're a Christian, you believe in uh God, Jesus, etc. How do you know if you've been cursed? Well, the curse of low self-esteem is one. I mean, whom among us has not felt such a curse at some point in their life? <laughs> uh I don't know. I mean, you you've got to go to an expert, and I'm Catholic, so we've got an expert for pretty much everything. I, I would say, you know, go to, pop pop on down to your local parish. Uh, inquire into where the nearest exorcist might in fact be and uh, just let them have a look at you you know look look for any signs of a curse 
um, the very first answer is it's possible but unlikely, so you should talk to your priest about it. Oh, well, that's the first answer. So there you go. Um, um, that's good. Here's the other. Here's yeah. another answer that's really important that I read. Um, so another user writes, "You're not cursed. You have you have to." You have to exceptionally important to be cursed by God, and I have not read about you in the Bible. <laughs> well, in fairness to the poster, it does not say cursed by God specifically. Right. You can be cursed by a lot of things, probably. Yeah, I do like the, uh, though, the, I mean, it's comforting to know that uh, if you're not very important, you can't be cursed by God. That makes me feel better about my own situation. <laughs> That's right. Uh, who am I that God would be mindful of me and curse me as a result? <laughs> uh i will say though on a serious note this kind of question is such a huge bummer actually um it's too bad it's too bad that christians are like i've been having a rough time i must be cursed uh instead of uh, i've been having a rough time i just really need to find some people who can build me up <laughs> yeah i know um but uh they've tried to stand up for themselves and they've not been taken seriously yeah well pray for our get better fr- get our better three, friends three months old get, Reddit friend. get fr- yeah that's right Get friends that will take you seriously, um, yeah. is what you should do. Yep, go to a better church. All right, next. You've got another gem here. Okay, here we go. This one is a little controversial, so uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. It does pander toward the carnal, as they, as they all do yeah, in the yeah. end. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, this is nine months ago. Not as fresh. you got to clear the cobwebs off this one, but it's pretty good, I think. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's the title of this post is... Adam and Eve incest plus Neanderthals? Oh, oh. Question mark. Hmm. Okay. All right. The user writes, so why would God start off humans on incest? Mm-hmm. And I guess Adam and Eve were also Neanderthals. <laughs> <laughs> That's my, my favorite part. is isn't even the incest part. It's just, it's just that I guess Adam and Eve were also Neanderthals. That's my fave. I love that. That's really good. Um, so what do you think? Why would God do that to Adam and Eve? And they were also in um, Neanderthals, I guess. It's a really good question. Uh, I remember this question specifically being asked one time in Sunday school when I was in high school. Um, and my Sunday school teacher, who was clearly not comfortable uh, with the question in the first place, simply uh, uncomfortably laughed it off uh, because he was a seven-day creationist. And uh, I guess that's really the only strategy I have for answering such a question. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a weird thing in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> well, but wait, so Adam and Eve clearly are not incestuous, right? Because no, 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 they're no. they're not like bloodlined, I guess. But uh, but all of their kids, though. Right, 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 right. All their kids, right? Hmm. Aren't there actually other people in the Bible when Adam and Eve have kids? Yeah, probably. I mean, I I kind of remember that part. So here's the thing they don't tell you in Bible school. The Bible doesn't say everything that that uh, officially happened. It just tells you some things that, you know, we know for sure happened. Uh, so presumably there's all kinds of other stuff. God probably made, I don't know, several different gardens, um, just different uh, different testing grounds, you know, and then one of them one of them messed up and that led to all the rest of them messing up. But we don't really know for sure that there weren't other kinds of people running around like lizard people, for example. <laughs> yeah. I love this idea. Oh, this garden, this is the one where I, I put the people with six fingers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. There's Ooh, a garden. Nope, for Neanderthals. Too many fingers. There's a, there's a garden for all kinds of uh, pre-human humans. All right. That's I, a troubling idea too, but it's okay. Yeah, I do though like to imagine uh like the Geico cavemen uh running around the Garden of Eden. Uh that right. really changes the whole narrative for me. They're there, for sure. They're there. Uh they're there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's more comforting the more you say it. They're there. Don't, <laughs> don't worry about these questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, good. Well, thank you for digging up those gems, Matt. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, always good to check in with the the real community of Christians over on Reddit. Uh, but let's uh, let's check in with the community of Christians in Soviet Russia. <laughs> <laughs> As Lenin is to the peasant socialists, we are to the posters of our Christianity. <laughs> uh, yeah, indeed. Um, so this chapter, like Matt said, comes from a book called red theology i just reviewed it for like an academic journal so i've been sitting around with it for a really long time and uh it is a good book it's extremely expensive though you can find it through nefarious means uh but you didn't hear it from us and uh in any case it's basically like it's kind of a collection of essays more or less it's like 
he does a little work to try to make this all seem like one big book but spoiler alert it's not it's a lot of it's a lot just a lot of chapters uh and this one is really fascinating so if you don't know anything about roland Bohr, we've talked about him once or twice on the show before um he does a ton of work on Christianity and communism, and that's kind of what he's known for, and he's been doing it for a long time. Uh, he wrote a big book on Lenin and religion, for example, and this chapter I think is kind of adapted from some of that research. Uh, sidebar, there's a great chapter in here on religion in the DPRK. Uh, so if you're interested in the kind of episodes that we've done on that in the past, you might want to get a hold of this particular chapter um but today we're talking about christian communism and the bolsheviks um so there's kind of a lot of different moving parts to this chapter he talks about peasants uh and peasant socialism and a kind of like christian socialist tradition that exist existed before the bolsheviks and then kind of persists like alongside the soviet revolution and then uh he also talks about uh leo tolstoy and the kind of vision of christian communism that he's presenting which is distinct from bolshevism of course but lenin had a lot to say about it and then lastly he talks about a group called the god builders in the soviet union who we're not going to talk about not because they're not worth mentioning but just because it's like a whole different wild thing and uh, you can get into the weeds really quick so instead we're going to limit ourselves just to the the tradition of peasant socialism and the uh, material on tolstoy so matt what kind of stuck out to you especially maybe about the peasants we could start there yeah um boy so much stuff i think what's so interesting to me about this is that i i don't know like in this in this uh in 2019 the year of our lord uh when we got dsa caucuses out the butt and um other kinds of uh people arguing on the internet constantly about marx it's always kind of interesting to hear about people who are socialists but like aren't marxists Mm -hmm. um so i kind of enjoyed that part that there's just like this like uh i don't know i don't know if organic is the right word but it seems like there's an organic type of socialism um amongst the peasants in russia that kind of just grew out of their village communes um and that is a really interesting thing Mm -hmm. that socialism is bigger than marx and um that's a good thing to keep in mind, I suppose. Uh, and I also like it, too, because Lenin um, Lenin and the Bolsheviks don't, like, you know, don't just sh- shoo it away. They pay attention to it and, you know, critique it, and that's fine, because um, they should. But uh, they pay attention, and that's, I think, a good part of the story, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and so they critique it, and they also, in paying attention to it, they try to find what's actually workable or usable within it, too. Uh, they're kind of, like, sifting these traditions out to figure out what's... Uh, what's something that could persist and be encouraged even uh, and what you know might be accidental or um, something you could kind of reasonably leave behind uh, and board does a really good job actually kind of challenging some of that as well so he doesn't just say like hey Lenin was right about everything he said uh, but he tries to kind of critically engage Lenin's critical engagement with the, these Christian uh, communist traditions um so yeah I guess uh we could kind of say well here's one way that Borg uh, summarizes this anyway um he says peasant socialism mediated through the village commune which hung on in russia into the 20th century would come to play a significant role in tolstoy's efforts to recover a form of early christianity so this is kind of one thread that gets picked up in the chapter peasant socialism through uh mediated through tolstoy and then Bohr goes on to say as we've seen in the, the rest of the chapter lenin and the bolsheviks were intrigued from time to time and even interested where it might benefit their project uh, but, he says, the religious dimension always remained suspect in an extraordinarily complex way. And that's probably the main thing to to pick up on here. Here, It's the, the complexity of that suspicion uh, that takes a little bit of teasing out. So we'll try to do some of that here. Yeah, and I think where Bohr ends up is kind of offering some interesting advice. Maybe not advice, but like an interesting way to think about Christian communism uh, and the Bolsheviks. Um, sort of a historical point that we can take away but we'll get there um okay so the chapter opens up uh with this kind of um big description a sort of uh, setting the scene um in russia uh it's kind of a long quote but i'm gonna go ahead and read it because uh it is talking about russia you know a long time ago so it's helpful (laughs) to kind of get a feel for what's up this chapter considers these currents in russia where the influence of peasant communes that was widespread in the various socialist movements of the late 19th and early 20th centuries with their common ownership of village lands, periodic real location of agricultural strips of land for cultivation, and the communal allocation of produce, these villages, these village communes were a particular Russian variation on subsistence survival agriculture. 
This ancient, well-tried, and remarkably persistent economic form produced much debate among the variety of communist groups in Russia. If we make use of these village communes, they thought, can we make a transition to socialism without passing through a full capitalist phase? That's actually a really important thing for uh, the Marxists that would come after. Um, Gramsci writes a lot about that, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The 19th century movement, Nardanaya Volya, or the People's Will, who were, um, by the way, anarchists who blew up the czar, so some good street cred. Um, <laughs> the 19th century movement, Nardanaya Volya, or the Narodniks, sought to do so, adding individual acts of terror, a preference followed by the later and larger socialist revolutionaries. They agitated for egalitarianism, the abolition of private property and land, and the equal division of the land or land tenure as the means to destroy poverty, unemployment, and exploitation. All right, so a big setting the stage kind of um, description of what's going on. Um, there's this like uh, tradition of peasant communes and like the socialists who aren't a part of the you know the peasant communes the the bolsheviks but also the anarchists they have to figure out like what are we going to do with these folks it seems like there's something interesting going on there how do we capitalize on it what is important uh what's not important yeah uh i mean anybody's taking kind of like a russian literature class or is familiar with the history of russian literature probably has some idea of this too um you know everybody from tulsa and dostoevsky to like gogol and and others are always sort of you know talking about the peasants and trying to create uh, or trying to express the scene of like peasant life, um, often in in contrast to bourgeois life, something like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, it really comes through not just in the literary scene, but politically. Like this is just a, a sort of thing that's in the air that needs to be taken seriously in Russian society, uh, and how it gets mediated politically is really fascinating. Um, probably also worth noting that you know the histories of revolutions are always more complex than just like one time there was a pre-revolutionary society and then after that there was a revolutionary one <laughs> like there's always lots and lots of people running around to different groups and different ideas of what's going to happen and uh this is i think a really great chapter because it just helps to complicate the story of the russian revolution in a really interesting way um one way in which that happens is bohr talks a lot about how this uh tradition of of peasant socialism gets interacted with in the early Soviet Union. And I want to share just one story that I thought was a really wild anecdote. Um, so Bohr pulls out this guy, Ivan Chekhanov, who was an activist peasant. And apparently this guy told Lenin that peasants were losing faith in the Bolshevik government early into the, the Soviet Union. And uh, Lenin responds not by kind of writing off the peasants or by, you know, I don't know, like complaining about it or whatever but he he tries to solve this problem by getting this guy Chekhanov appointed to uh, uh, the position of representative of the People's Commissariat of Agriculture so he tries to give him this governmental position um, and he also tries to, to let him advocates for setting up a, a non-party peasant council to kind of give peasants a say and make them feel like they have their own you know reasons to be participating in the society and Bohr kind of tells the story this way, and this is also kind of a long quote, but it just helps, you know, get a lot of moving parts in place that we could talk about for a minute. Uh, Bohr says, The vital point is that Chekhanov, according to Lenin, and this is Lenin writing here, sympathizes with the communists but will not join the party because he goes to church and is a Christian. He says he rejects the ritual but is a believer. Also, probably a very interesting thing about uh, peasant life in general. So Bohr goes on to say, Before Lenin stands a communist-leaning Christian peasant whom Lenin is eager to enlist in the process of communist reconstruction. He sees an opportunity to go much further, for in developing the basis for a non-party peasant council, Lenin suggests that it should begin with an old farmer who favors the peasants and workers, along with another person from an area not producing grain. Crucially, not only should they be experienced, but, Lenin says, and here's another quote, it would be good for all of them to be both non-party men and Christians. That's the end of the quote. And Bohr adds, only such an organization would gain the confidence of peasants, showing both support for the communist government from outside its own ranks and revealing that Christians may not be so much of a threat to the success of the revolution. Uh, so here you just get a really interesting kind of meditation as mediated through Bohr of Lenin thinking about how to solve this problem. And, and the solution is not to double down on a kind of militant atheism or something or to say, you know, well, the peasants are just being stupid or whatever, but rather to figure out, well, is there a way that we could try to accommodate 
uh, you know, the the really actually progressive part of of what's happening among peasants and bring this in. And, and that also meant for him recognizing the importance of affirming a role for for Christians to be able to, uh, you know, support the government in their in their own way or on their own terms. Yeah, pretty cool. OK, so getting the peasants to participate in the government is good. Um, but then Bohr goes on to talk about how um, there's type there's a type of like theology behind the um, the socialism of the peasant communes that is important not to just like ignore. Um, so uh, to get at some of those theological concerns or those ideas that are um, there for the peasants, uh, he goes on to quote this priest who he just calls uh, Tikvinsky, um, who was a representative in like the uh, I guess pre-revolutionary um, like legislative body. Um, so Lenin uh, Lenin has a quote from this priest Tkvinsky uh, on um, the peasant understanding of land and theology. So Lenin uh, Lenin's quoting the priest here. This is the way the peasants, the way the working people look at land. The land is God's, and the laboring peasant has as much right to it as each one of us has the right to water and air. It would be strange if anyone were to start selling, buying, or trading water and air, and it seems just as strange to us that anyone should trade in, sell, or buy land. Uh, Bohr uh, reminds us at the end of this that we cannot miss the basic theological justification for this claim. The land is God's. Um, this is like a pretty interesting, um, yeah, theological point. It sounds a lot like maybe the the diggers or... Um, or some of the other sort of like pre-Marxist socialists in um, England. Um, but Bohr goes on to note that Lenin finds, you know, all of that nice um, enough. Uh, Bohr says it's uh, Lenin finds it admirable, but somewhat simplistic. And uh, that the underlying reality of capitalism would render any land reform um, without like sort of a socialist revolution uh, futile because capitalism was already putting land and water up for sale in the large industrial centers, mines and factories, apart from the sale of labor power and its consequent consequent wage slavery. Um, so here we go. Lenin thinks that this is not so bad what the um, peasants believe, even if it even if it is founded in theology and not uh, Marxism. But uh, it's kind of too simplistic because um, capitalism is already doing away with some of the things that uh, that would uh, go along with the land reform. Yeah, uh, it is such a fascinating thing to point out, though. I mean, like you said, it links to this sort of uh, interesting idea in Christianity, like in uh, the the diggers. We've talked about Gerard Wynn Stanley on the podcast before a long time ago, uh, who had exactly this kind of theology, right? That like all land is common, so you shouldn't be building enclosures, which is the the way in which in England um, sort of primitive accumulation happened where capitalists started taking land that was actually public and, and making it private. And uh, when Stanley and the diggers had exactly this kind of logic, right, that uh, God gave the land to everybody and everybody has a right to use it. And it's it's like an absurd thing to suggest otherwise. And it's interesting that this is almost like a uh, like a, a naive belief in a, in a positive sense, that this is just like common sense that of course, nobody should own this land. Uh, how could you ever uh, have a private claim on it? Um, and then the the second point too, I think, is also fascinating that Lenin is, is willing to like affirm that as a as an intuition, and then add the I, obviously I would agree sort of appropriate point <laughs> that um, well if that's how you feel, then the the sort of political program that accompanies it has to preclude private accumulation of land in the first place. Um, so yeah, just a really interesting way of, of kind of inadvertently bringing these two traditions together of Marxism and Christianity. Yeah, totally. Um, so there you go. There you have it. The peasant socialists, they're there and Lenin's, um, into it kind of, you know, <laughs> not into it is probably too strong of a word, but, uh, you know, he understands it and doesn't like just, uh, cast them off for being religious people or something. Yeah, it's like, it's interesting because you can understand how there would be a strategic reason to feel this way, and surely that is probably the primary reason that motivates Lenin to care about this at all. Um, but in addition to the strategy bit, uh, Lenin also seems to be somewhat genuinely kind of, you know, interested in the development anyway. Um, and that's kind of a neat, neat thing anyhow. Yeah, totally. It does actually help. I mean, when, when it comes to Marxism-Leninism, there's like... Uh, or I mean, just Marxism and like the theory of history in general, there is this kind of question about how does the Soviet Union, 
you know, kind of just go from feudalism to socialism. And I think that there is definitely some answers here that there's like a, uh, a latent type of socialism already kind of prevalent in society. So it makes mm-hmm. some more sense than maybe um, some would think. <laughs> there, yeah. There's this whole thing where Gramsci is just like, well, it didn't happen by the usual means. And it's like, well, okay. Why. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Bolsheviks are pretty flexible in some ways, not in others, but interesting in this way. Um, so Bohr kind of concludes his discussion of uh, peasant socialism, saying that the the examples that he pulls out, these and, and some others, are, he says, occasional and often marginal. But they begin to reveal a picture in which Lenin and the Bolsheviks would occasionally stop and pay attention to radical peasants. They have much to criticize, but they could not help feeling a deep affinity. Yet Lenin and the Bolsheviks cannot avoid the fact that the peasants' unrelenting attacks against the landlords and against unjust land distribution drew their inspiration from theological and biblical sources. Um, I think, too, I mean, there's obviously a huge, like, piece of this that is reliant on the fact that what they're talking about is an agricultural uh, group of people, right? Like, it's a very agrarian situation. Um, And that probably makes it more difficult to understand, like, the problems of capitalism per se than, you know, a, a highly industrialized situation. Uh, I mean, that's kind of what Marx says anyway. That's why you need yeah. like, capitalism to get there. Um, but yeah, it's like it's cool that in finding the socialist tradition that comes along with the agrarianism, uh, they're able to to kind of work with what they've got um, and affirm it in a qualified way. Yeah, totally. Um, OK, well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about Tolstoy. Yeah. So I think that Tolstoy is kind of why I am the person I am. <laughs> <laughs> that's a dumb that sounds dumb uh but i don't mean it because like he's a great writer but because i read the kingdom of gods within you when i was like a sophomore and i was like this is it <laughs> yeah yeah same uh same here um it was a lul and Tolstoy. i read them both like in the same summer after i graduated high school and that was like the my political program <laughs> yeah um it's not a bad way in Lenin yeah. doesn't think so, at least. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. That that I guess if you take nothing away from this episode of the podcast, uh, maybe just recall that uh, Lenin affirmed people's very weird entries into socialism. Yeah, I think it's good though, right? Yeah. Like that that um that Lenin could be that flexible with people, um, and how they are going to support socialism or whatever is pretty good, right? The, you know, it's not like the the peasants or even Tolstoy were like developed Marxist thinkers he just kind of like you know they were just they were just there and Lenin said all right (laughs) I guess yeah yeah. right right it wasn't like he was chastising them for not having read capital or something yeah uh well we should talk about what Bohr thinks and what Lenin thinks about Tulsa but we should sit for just a minute about maybe uh our own kind of experience um so Tulsa wrote this book called the kingdom of God is within you um he wrote like a number of novels and in the novels he kind of dramatizes a lot of uh problems around wealth inequality among other things but the the kingdom of god is within you is really his like um it's it's a philosophical or theological essay about uh the political r- ramifications of christianity and it's very idiosyncratic if you've never read it before tolstoy has a, a really particular form of christianity like he believes in some parts of the Gospels, but like not all of them. And uh, he kind of does like the same thing that people like Thomas Jefferson do. Like the, they, you know, remove all the supernatural or mir- miraculous stuff. And then they try to like distill out the uh, ethical principles. And the ethical things that Tolstoy really likes are uh, nonviolence. He's like a really radical pacifist. And this uh, um, idea of like communal life outside of private property. These are kind of two of the main things that he uh takes out of the the christian tradition um so an extremely weird christian oh and, and also a hatred of the state that's maybe the third very important component it's actually the most important i think for yeah me. <laughs> yeah totally or it was when i was like 19 yeah yeah well and the the hatred of the state kind of ties all the rest of it together right like you hate the state because it's violent so if you're if you like nonviolence, then for tolstoy you also have to hate the state um and the same with like communal life like if you if you really want to live that kind of life then you can't really do it in the way that the state is sort of set up um so yeah i mean 
I don't know, Matt. What, what really? Uh, you, you just said like that. That bit about the state really appealed to you back then. Uh, but what maybe specifically stood out to you as a young angsty uh, evangelical? Yeah. Well, I think just like okay. So Tolstoy, The Kingdom of God is the New, is like the perfect transitional text if you are a well-intentioned and open-minded young Christian person who has grown up in a conservative environment. Because if you if you're all of those things, if you're like willing to kind of engage with some big ideas and you want to be really serious about your Christian faith and just get that closer walk with V, uh, you you read this old Tolstoy guy and he says a lot of things that you like. He's all about a really simple Christianity, um, all about that sermon on the on the mount, right? There's like a type of fundamentalism, even though he rejects the supernatural elements, that um, I think is pretty palatable to conservative readers. Um, and, you know, coming from that sort of conservative Christian background, um, the skepticism that many of them have for the state is there. And, you know, you find, a, a you know, an articulation by which you can, like, actually say, like, no, the state is bad and morally unjust, right? Tolstoy gives you, uh, sorry, Tolstoy gives, like, conservative Christians, I think, like, uh, just a knife by which you can cut against, um you know, uh, authority that you already are kind of programmed not to like sort of ideologically because of Christianity in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. I mean, I remember reading it at the time and I was like a very kind of biblicist evangelical. And, uh, I remember being somewhat turned off by like his dismissal of, uh, miracles and the supernatural or whatever. Um, but even that being said, like, I couldn't really help but be pulled in to read the entire book just because I also felt that he had such a, like, firm grasp on the real biblical demands that he was kind of attentive to. Yeah. Um, it's a weird, it was, it was a very weird feeling to read back then because I was like, this guy's wrong about so many things because, you know, I was a conservative Christian. Uh, but he's also, like, really challenging me because as a conservative Christian, I want to take the Bible seriously. And Tolstoy is basically like, you know, throwing down the gauntlet and being like, if you really took it seriously, then you'd have to hate the state or you'd have to like hate violence or whatever. Yeah, that's right. There's a uh, part in here somewhere. Um, maybe we have it that we'll get to in a second or something. But Bohr even says like, that's where the revolutionary impulse within Christianity comes from is like um, seeing the world as it is not supposed to be and mm-hmm. like knowing in some way how you can set it right. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why Christianity is revolutionary and sometimes for the worse, but <laughs> sometimes not. I don't know. If you listen to Lenin more than Tolstoy, it's not so bad. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's a great point to transition. So Tolstoy was both a, a way in or a way in for, for both of us. But uh, also, you know, neither of us are Tolstoyans these days. Um, and I think that I'm not a Tolstoyan for basically the same reasons that Lenin is not a Tolstoyan. And <laughs> uh, in a weird way, reading this article actually allowed me to kind of appreciate Tolstoy in a different way. Um, because of how Lenin appreciates him. So Bohr kind of just introduces the situation like this, trying to explain why Lenin would even feel the need to to write about Tolstoy, who's a pretty bourgeois writer in, in many ways. Um, so basically, the basic point is because Tolstoy was super popular, but Bohr summarizes it like this. Tolstoy had become so influential on his death on the 20th of November 1910 that many indeed tried to claim him for their own cause. His spiritual awakening, call for a return to simple Christianity, like the Sermon on the Mount, vegetarianism, peasant values, even his wearing peasant clothes, nonviolent resistance, and trenchant criticism of the state and modern society lent him a moral authority on par with his literary achievements. And then Borg goes on to add, I've taken some time with Lenin's assessment of Tolstoy since it's also the most sustained engagement with a form of Christian communism. So, there there's a Tolstoy became this kind of towering moral figure in Russian society uh not just because of his achievements in writing these amazing novels or whatever uh but also because he was trying to live out a, a genuinely kind of weird life motivated by these ethical principles he famously like gave away a ton of his wealth he came from uh, nobility and had a had a bunch of wealth and gave all that away um and so he you know like he earned it he earned the the respect by how he lived his life um and I think it's also fascinating that Bohr makes the point that uh, so Lenin had to deal with Tolstoy as a cultural figure, but also it's fascinating for Christians, I think, because it is probably the most sustained uh, engagement that Lenin really has with a form of Christian communism, Tolstoy's form, even if that's not, you know, the only or ultimate form of Christian for- Christian communism or something like that. Yeah, that's right. So um, Borg goes on to talk more about Tolstoy and like kind of what he's about specifically. 
Uh, Bohr talks about Tolstoy less as a communist and more as an anarchist, and I think that makes some sense because, um, I mean, you know, all anarchists, well, not, I don't know, this is complicated, I suppose, but anarchism and communism have a pretty, like, you know, close relationship, but uh, the specific articulation of Tolstoy's politics are one where he's super skeptical of the state, right? So he usually gets lumped in with anarchists. And uh, I think it makes a lot of sense, too, if you kind of read his theological articulations of politics, too, because he, you know, um, it's it's God above all other things, right? So it's a type of, I think, Christian anarchism um, that has some extremely uh, communist elements to it. Yeah, uh, I think, too, what's cool about this article is Bohr goes on to sort of explain that Tolstoy's anarchism influences the communist movement, uh, which is something that people don't often pay attention to. Like, it's not like... I mean, the Bolsheviks were incredibly polemical. Lenin is a master polemicist, and if he doesn't like you, um, boy, I feel bad for you. <laughs> but, like, he's got some some really venomous writing. Uh, but with someone like Tolstoy, uh, there is a, a certain uh, dialogue or exchange, and, and communism isn't the kind of thing that just kind of emerges with just these sectarian impulses, right? It's like all these things are influencing one another and challenging one another. Um, Bohr himself actually disagrees a bit with Lenin's assessment of Tolstoy, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but just to kind of start getting this on the table, uh, Bohr says that Lenin's main argument is that Tolstoy's criticism of Russian economics and society are largely correct, but that his biblically inspired solutions are wayward if not regressive. Communists must therefore listen to and make the most of Tolstoy's insightful criticisms, but offer more thoroughgoing and forward-looking answers. So we'll talk about how Bohr complicates that in a minute, um, but I think that's a good way to at least get us sort of into Lenin's take on Tolstoy. Yeah, but I guess before we get there, though, let me just say that Lenin is right here. <laughs> because, yeah. I mean, Tolstoy's, Tolstoy's politics... Okay, so he does, you know, recognize... Um, some stuff about Russian economics and society and that kind of thing. But like ultimately the politics that Tolstoy has are like, uh, you know, a more authentic Christianity. Um, and I think that is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And there'll be more opportunities to, to talk about that as we go. That's great. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> um, cool. So Bohr also goes on to say that the solution for Tolstoy was to draw upon two traditions. The first was the perpetual dynamic reform in the Christian tradition especially in response to a corrupt church enmeshed with a derailed socioeconomic political system. Uh, the reform in question saw an authentic original Christianity cutting away the accretions of institutional time. So there you go. That's that, um, that's that type of like, I, I guess, biblicism and like simple Christianity of the Sermon on the Mount that Tolstoy is all about. And um, the kind that I think is sort of a problem. Uh, Christianity is a complicated thing and people are always saying well we've got it wrong we need to go backwards but we never recognize how going backwards is also a problem <laughs> yeah for sure i mean there's there's a couple of interesting things here um he in the kingdom of god is within you he actually quotes a few quakers which i think is interesting and maybe gives you a perspective on the kind of christianity that he was invested in he didn't identify as a quaker as far as i know but uh He's he's pulling from that. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the big challenge to sort of the rhetoric of returning to a more original form of Christianity is always that um, not only is it a kind of imagination of going backwards, but it's always a, a, a vision of the past that's constructed in the present. Um, so it's a which is to say it's a it's a it's a um, a present informed uh, invention of an original Christianity, not like the, the true discovery of Christianity as though that was even possible. Um, but that is kind of what Tolstoy is arguing for, right? Um, that if we went back to this original form and just really understood it without all the extra stuff, like the institutional stuff, uh, all this miracle garbage and mumbo jumbo that was added on to it in Tolstoy's opinion, uh, then we would know what we're doing. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, it's important to recognize that that's sort of an impossible task. Yeah. That like, well, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a really weird Baudrillardian problem where you can't really recreate something that's past, you know, it's like, right. uh, it's always contaminated by whatever the situation that you're in. So the, um, you know, looking for an authentic Christianity is always going to give you something inauthentic. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like, Tolstoy is not a, a hardcore trad Catholic or something like that, um, but he suffers from a similar problem where um, 
you think that you've got your finger on the original, but in fact, you're just creating something new. Right. I mean, there, he's, you're right. He's not a hardcore like uh, Tradcath, but like Protestants do this just right. as thoroughly and badly as Tradcaths do, right? Right. Like they, right. That, that's what I mean. Protestantism is all, that's what Protestantism is all about. It's just like, um, you know, we're going to get rid of all of this, like all these funny costumes. We're just going to get back <laughs> to the, that good gospel. Right. Uh, and in doing so, you just created something different. Right. And I don't know. Like, that's that's fine that people do that, but we shouldn't trick ourselves in thinking that's authentic when it's just like, you know, a reconstruction. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just like let it be what it is. Yeah. So maybe we should talk a little bit more about Lenin and his specific problems with Tolstoy. So uh, the the big one that we've kind of already mentioned here is this nostalgia, right, that, that Tolstoy, Lenin thinks, has this kind of vision for the past. Um, but it's also an issue of uh, like not noticing the real contradictions at the heart of Russian society. So Lenin will often praise Tolstoy for like dramatizing real contradictions between like bourgeois people and peasants, for example, or like you know these these fundamental kind of weird social uh, things that Tolstoy is so good at capturing um, in in a literary form. But Lenin notes that he doesn't ever identify the kinds of antagonisms that a Marxist is interested in. Um, you know, like between capital and labor power specifically or something like that. Like you might sort of pick that up reading between the lines here and there. Um, but Lenin thinks it's pretty insufficiently developed. And I think that's probably right, not just in terms of the literature, but uh, also and maybe even more so in terms of his uh, solutions in the kingdom of God is within you. You don't really get uh, a real good i think political understanding of how capitalism operates or even how like agrarian economies operate in a book like that you just kind of get like a like tolstoy is a moralist not a not a politician and yeah. uh that's fine but it's it doesn't help you out when you're trying to build a revolutionary society yeah i think Bohr draws it out pretty well when he talks about nonviolence uh and sort of like the the discord between lenin's understanding of violence and tolstoy so uh, in in the in the board chapter, he says that like Lenin um, conceives like violence always starting from the right, and that uh, Tolstoy's like non-resistance or sort of non-violent resistance is uh, always going to have a problem with that. You right. Know? Like. Right. And I think it's a good point. It's a good criticism of non-violence. I think. Yeah. Or yeah. or the Tolstoyan type of non-violence, right? It's like right. the sort of Gandhian kind of thing where mm -hmm. you just you just take what they give to you. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I mean that that's the whole thing about Bolshevism, right? It's like you need to be able to build an apparatus capable of of resisting the violence that will inevitably erupt rather than just kind of like ceding all the territory that you just won back to the reactionaries who are willing to take it from you. Yeah, totally. Um, all right, so I feel like the, the criticisms that Lenin gives are, are pretty, like, obvious and standard. Um, but we could talk maybe a little bit more about Bohr's adjudication of all of that, because he has some interesting things, and I think I sort of d disagree with Bohr and, and agree more with Lenin, but not without gaining a lot from Bohr's conversation. So um, let me read... Uh, a, a kind of long passage on how Bohr kind of summarizes all of Lenin, and then we can also talk about what Bohr thinks about Christian communism. So Bohr writes, Lenin attempts to quarantine the religious dimensions of Tolstoy's thought and practice to a regressive form of communalism. At the same time, Lenin seeks to detach the insightful criticisms from any religious features so they might be appropriated for the communist movement. The problem with this move is twofold, despite the insights generated by its dialectical engagement. First, revolutionary criticism is also inspired by the tradition of Christian communism. If a society does not live up to the prescriptions found in the scriptures, then it must be criticized in the name of a better world. But this is to separate too sharply revolutionary criticism from communal life. The catch is that these two dimensions are so often entwined in the Christian communist tradition, where the alternative communistic life entails within itself critique of the world as it is leading at times to the necessity of revolutionary action. So that's the first problem, is Lenin doesn't really uh, kind of understand like the, the real radical nature of the critique that's being made by Tolstoy on these kind of Christian grounds. Uh, Lenin's second problem, Bohr says, all he sees in Tolstoy's religious heritage is a nostalgia rather than hope, quietism rather than action, retreat rather than advance, yet these prescriptions are not necessarily regressive, for they're able to look forward as well as backward. So many of the Christian communist organizations that emerged throughout European history also look to the future by drawing on the past, 
advocating a simplicity of life, hard work, and eschewing political power for the sake of providing alternative models of cooperative existence. All right, so it's a super long chunk, and uh, maybe I'll take a break from talking and let you uh, react to it there, Matt. I'm reacting. Um, <laughs> this is my li- my live react to <laughs> <laughs> Lenin's problem with Tolstoy and why he's wrong. Now, I don't know. Um, I don't understand. I kind of like, so I, I mean, I read this just like you did. Um, and I don't really understand how, what he means that it is a looking forward and looking backward. Because to me, I don't see that. In Tolstoy, I see a looking backward um, mm-hmm. kind of only. Uh, I, I mean, it, it is the case that he is he's deriving like, you know, a moral or like an individual ethic based on um, a specific reading of christianity but like i don't see it as a forward-looking project in the same way that like bolshevism is a forward-looking project. (laughs) right right i I don't know and so my reaction my my live react to this is that like -uh. (laughs) nah. i just like don't i just don't see it and maybe i'm not like maybe i'm maybe i'm in the dark here but it doesn't seem like that's the case to me yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, there's a point that Boris making that's kind of interesting, specifically about Christian communism, uh, really drawing from these, uh, you know, like a, like a genuinely radical critique of the world based on a vision of it not living up to the ethical precepts of Christianity or something like that. I mean, I think that's true. I mean, that that's the reason I became a communist. You know, I yeah, I, absolutely. Me so too. yeah, like I'm I'm down with that, and like yeah, I, I guess I think that communists should be able to at least understand and appreciate that way of, of moral reasoning, even if they don't agree with it. Um, but I don't, I also don't think it's like necessary. Like if somebody doesn't get it, I kind of just don't blame them. Or if they don't think that it's like, you know, important, um, I wouldn't really argue that actually it super is. Uh, and I guess that's the weird thing is like, I don't really know what would have added to Lenin's treatment of Tolstoy if he had sort of taken these things into account, even if they're very revealing for like, what christians think or something yeah that's a good point right like well i i mean and for tolstoy too some of it is some of his reading of the gospel is kind of like about its absurdity or mysticism and like Mm -hmm. that would just not make sense to a person who's not a christian and like it probably shouldn't right yeah exactly and i mean even this idea of like european socialist traditions sort of creating a vision of the future by having a, an idea of life in the past or something like that, or, or the simplicity of life that Bohr points out here. Um, there's a reason that Marxists actually didn't get down with that. Uh, they could have, right. Um, but Marx spends a lot of time like arguing against pre-Marxian forms of socialism precisely because, uh, those aren't really great starting points. If you want to come up with a, a workable political program to generate, you know, an effective political transition in an industrial society. Uh, certainly I think there's a real critique to be made about the futurism that's sometimes present in traditions of communism and the Soviet union, especially, um, I really do think that like, you know, there's something to be said for critiquing the kind of modernism that's at the heart of it, at the heart of it, and the the sheer dismissal of like all tradition that sometimes happens in certain Bolshevik uh, projects or authors. But at the same time, I'm not sure that this is really the way to make that critique. Yeah, I agree. And it's also, I mean, you, you know, we were saying the thing earlier about how uh, you can't really go back to a an originary Christianity or something. And it's not like Tolstoy even does that, though. Tolstoy's reading of Christianity is, like, extremely modern as it is, too, right? right? So it's, he's just as guilty of it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it isn't the case that Tolstoy is, is going back to medieval Christianity or right. even, even, like, ancient Greek Christianity, right? It is something different. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I don't know, uh, I think at the end of the day, like, sure, it would have been nice to hear what Lenin said, I guess, about Christian communism a little bit more, but at the same time, Bohr helps us understand that already in the kind of previous section where he's talking about peasant socialism and how Lenin interacted with it, you know, trying to find a role for peasant Christians in the government, or trying to appreciate the theology of, like, the common distribution of land and that sort of a thing. And to me, like, that's kind of enough. Like, I feel like that's, like, those are really great, and I feel completely satisfied with that. (laughs) Yeah, me too. I think that's good, right? Like, in that Christian Marxist dialogue, that's a huge deal. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. I don't really need him to say more. <laughs> you said enough, Lennon. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. If you like what you heard in this episode, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash the Magnificast. Uh, the intro music is by Amari Armstrong. The outro music is by The Illogical Spoon. Um, cool. See you next week. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church We'll meet down by the riverside There we'll swim with all creation Never get tired, never bored Don't worry, someday There'll be no damn between us and our Lord